This is lecture two for lesson three. So who makes spatial data? These days, I think the answer is everyone, even you. But traditionally, spatial data is created by governments, and mapping has often been driven by defense concerns. Now, civil organizations like the U.S. Census Bureau create a huge amount of the spatial data that we all rely upon. National mapping efforts like the Census or the U.K. Ordnance Survey provide the basic boundaries and socioeconomic attributes that others can build upon. If you think back to lab number one that we worked with, we used Esri tapestry data that describes all those crazy sounding cliched neighborhood names and it tries to bucket people together into one big category for business planning purposes. That tapestry data is actually built upon some uh, foundational stuff that's created by the Census Bureau. So the industry in this case has added something to the existing government spatial data source. And you're making spatial data all the time now, even while you're taking this class. It's happening right now. Your IP address is logged by Coursera. And from your IP address, we can derive a decent physical location. It's not always super accurate, but usually it's pretty close. And if you own a mobile phone, you probably agree to terms and conditions that allow the phone company to log your location. I don't know if I did or not because I just signed all those stupid papers and got the heck out of the store as fast as I could. But it's not all scary. There's a good thing called volunteer geographic information that I think is a worthwhile trend. OpenStreetMap is a good example of volunteered geographic information. OpenStreetMap aims to create a free and reusable base map for the whole world using volunteer efforts alone. This is really important because a lot of the mapping services that you and I depend upon are actually privately held. That means we have no right to use that data for free, for example. They could start charging for it any time. We have no right to download it and save it for ourselves. We have no right to reuse it in our own applications. And a good thing about OpenStreetMap is that all of those things are possible because it's fundamentally an open project. These volunteer contributions have been hugely helpful in recent disasters, like the 2011 Haiti earthquake. I want you to check out this very small video clip showing additions to the OpenStreetMap base map in the wake of the 2011 Haiti earthquake. It's just amazing what happens here. Right after the earthquake occurs, hundreds of people start contributing thousands of new pieces of spatial data to pr provide a much better base map so that volunteers, first responders, people focused on recovery efforts in Haiti have a better base map to work with than what we had before. This is a part of the world that was not very well mapped, actually, prior to this disaster. And certainly the existing spatial data that was out there wasn't free. So this is, I think, a really good thing. Now, once you've got points, lines, polygons, and rasters, you've created some spatial data, you have to describe it. And if it's not described, it's not going to be usable. So you have to add attributes to spatial data in order to make it actionable. Let's look at an example here. This table shows tweets taken from a time right around, right before, uh, during, and after the Japan earthquake in 2011. I've got longitude information, latitude stuff, uh, usernames, what people tweeted, and the times that those things happened. And the location here is coming from the device. So you can actually enable Twitter, in this case, to uh, post your GPS-derived location along with your tweet, so you can map it. But if all I had here was the latitude and longitude coordinates, I'd just have a set of points, right? I wouldn't have anything that I could do with that information. I have to have the username so I can go and look at other conversations those people had. I have to have the tweet text so I can make sense of what was happening at that given time and make a story out of it. And I have to have the time in order to animate the whole thing, right? So this is a good example of how you need attributes in order, and things that describe data in order to make any sense out of spatial information. And then we've got something called metadata. Metadata is data about the data. It's a description of what exists in the data, what does it cover, who creates it. Metadata can help you make judgments about data quality, and this is one of its most important roles. A lot of times when you make a map, you've got data layers from multiple times, multiple sources, uh, partially uh, overlapping coverages. You get all kinds of problems like this. That's what happens when you make a map. And there's always some uncertainty associated with spatial data for that reason. Maybe uh, your road layer is one year older than your building's layer. That could be a totally sort of typical problem in mapping. And metadata can help you make a judgment about whether or not to abandon the project, go collect new data, or uh, look for a different source. And while maps always have some uncertainty because we can't perfectly represent the Earth and its dynamic processes in the form of data, that doesn't mean that they're useless. We deal with uncertain weather predictions all the time. That doesn't matter, right? We believe the stupid crap that our family posts on Facebook. That doesn't matter. 
we, we account for uncertainty all the time in our daily lives. So it's not to discourage you from making maps just because we can't always have perfect data. It's just to realize that one thing is for sure, while we don't have perfect data, we will have at least some that we can use.